All right. Hello, everyone. As you're coming in, please let us know where you're tuning in from, what brought you here today uh, or tonight, um, what you'd like to learn. Um, I am, uh, despite my background, which is a virtual background, I am uh, in the Hartford area, not at the, not at the house. Um, that is closed up tight for the evening. Uh, but yeah, let us know where you're tuning in from. I know we have people from all over the country. Um, and I will get started with my introduction. Hello, if this is your first time, um, I'm Omar Acevedo, and I'm the Literary Program Coordinator at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this virtual program for American White Lash, A Changing Nation and the Cost of Progress. First, I want to thank our sponsors. Our virtual programs are produced in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. We are happy to honor his memory with these programs. And we are also incredibly grateful to the Wish You All Foundation and Connecticut Public WNPR for supporting all of our virtual programs. Um, I know some of you are members, but if you're not, uh, or if you have a family member or friend, um, please uh, ask them if they uh, would like support to support our museum by becoming a member. Um, all members receive free admission to our author programs, the house and museum, year-round discounts in the store and cafe, and much more. Um, you can visit our website for more information on that. Um, and now uh, our guests. Our author, Wesley Lowry, is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, reporter, editor, and best selling author known for his written work. He is currently a journalist in residence at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at City University of New York, a contributing editor at the Marshall Project, and the creator and host of BET's America in Black. His first book, They Can't Kill Us All, Ferguson, Baltimore, and a New Era in America's Racial Justice Movement uh, is a New York Times bestseller and won the 2017 Christopher Isherwood Prize for Autobiographical Prose from the LA, LA Times Book Prizes. Our moderator, Christina Greer, is an associate professor of political science at Fordham University's uh, Lincoln Center campus. Her book, Black Ethnics, Race, Immigration, and the Pursuit of the American Dream, investigates the increasingly ethnically diverse Black populations in the U.S. from Africa and the Caribbean. She received her BA from Tufts University and her MA, MPhil, and PhD in political science from Columbia University. Um, now, we encourage you to have a conversation in the chat, um, but if you have a specific question, try to post that in the Q&A section. Um, you can also click on captions to see live auto captioning for the program. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, I will be putting a link in the chat to purchase American White Lash through our museum store. Your purchase will support our museum and our honored guest. Um, that is all for me. I will turn this over to Wesley and Christina. Please sit back and enjoy. Thanks so much, Omar. And I want to thank everyone for joining in. Um, I am a proud trustee of the Mark Twain House. And so it's my honor as a trustee to have these amazing conversations with Pulitzer Prize winner. I have to say it, we gotta say it. Um, <laughs> Wesley Lowry, who's written his second book and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to talk about your first book because I really love the continuation of thought. Um, so I really encourage you all to think about your questions. We're gonna end at around seven. 45, 750 to make sure you all have an opportunity to ask Wesley anything you, you want. Um, some of you may not have read the book. I don't want to give away any spoilers, but it's America. You kind of know where we are. Um, so there shouldn't be too many surprises. But I'm so interested in talking to you, Wesley, about the nuance and the beautiful prose, which I think, you know, in academia, when someone wants to give you a dig, they say, your book is accessible. Right? So someone's like, oh, your book's very accessible. And I was like, Thanks. Like to me, that's the highest praise you can give someone because that means someone who maybe knows a little bit about the subject or is interested in about the subject or is trying to put the pieces together can do so by reading one's work. And I really think that this book here, I'm going to put it up so American White Lash, so everyone can see it, 
really does open a conversation for some and continues a conversation for others and really elevates a conversation for another group. You're really, I think, meeting people where they are and giving them real concrete examples to paint a really very clear picture. So I just wanna congratulate you on the book. We know that for those of you who are in the audience, shout out to all the people tuning in from, uh, from Connecticut, um, it's not easy to write a book and obviously the process is difficult. And what you're writing about is so complex and it weighs on us because we're writing about people that we actually do care about as well. Um, so I wanna just start with the first pieces. What was the impetus for you to write this book on the heels of your last book? And was there a particular catalytic moment that sort of made you think, this? I need to get back to, to the laptop and, and put all these thoughts together? Well, it's a really, it's a good question. I really appreciate that. And, you know, I'm thinking about, so they, you know, they, there's the dig of saying the book is accessible or what also happens sometimes is when you write and when you work to write sentences that are readable, you then get the dig that, well, all this is more rhetoric than it is, you know, and mm -hmm. th than it is methodical. And I actually reject that mm -hmm. as well, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think that something doesn't have to read like a boring research paper to be grounded in empirical truth, mm -hmm. in rigorous research, in fact-checking journalism, right? And I think that sometimes... It's hard. I'm, I'm playing with this. I still consider myself pretty young as a writer, but I but I try to play around with and think about different kinds of the form, mm -hmm. right? And and to do things that are definitive and that can speak with clarity, that are based and rooted in rigorous examination, but also that are written in a compelling and accessible way. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important. Um, and I think that in this case, very specifically. This topic is something that has been covered and well covered, I think, in a more academic way. There are some brilliant and smart researchers on the white supremacist movement. They've done a lot of empirical studies. But I but I found this topic, you know, even someone who's intensely interested in it and had some background in it, extremely inaccessible to the layman, in part because the leading writers on it are all um, from a much more either historically steep space or a sociologically steep space academics writing out their areas of academic expertise for other academics on an issue that impacts all of us. Right. And, and so I thought about this a lot as to some extent was I doing a rigorous real-time contemporary pop history of the white supremacist movement. Mm -hmm. Understanding that I was not necessarily uncovering some massive thing that had never been covered before, that it was important to me to be uh gracious and liberal in my citation of experts who've worked on these issues and that and that someone who is more of a layman through reading this book could be introduced to the proper nouns uh, that they should that they should pay attention to otherwise or, oh I should go read that book that was cited here I should look up this this professor or this researcher's work right so I thought about all of that a lot as well the um you know I wrote my first book they can't kill us all about being a young black reporter covering the rise of what we've come to know as the Black Lives Matter movement mm -hmm. and writing about this emergence of a movement for racial and social justice, a, a new era in the civil rights, in our civil rights movement that emerged in the latter years of the first black presidency. And I wrote that book from my experiences being on the ground covering these issues, from my relationships and, and repeated interviews of many of the young people who were leading these fights in different places. Um, and I tried to place that moment into a context, right? That I don't think it was an accident that we saw this emergence at uh, during the end of the Obama administration. And as 2015 gave way to 2016, I had spent a fair amount of time imagining what my job would look like in the coming presidential administration. I thought about how would it be different to cover an emerging civil rights movement under a black president um, now that we were potentially gonna have a woman president? How would it, would there be more effort and energy given around women's movement, around liberation, around sexual issues, around anything, right? How would, how would it, how would this change, even as someone with very similar, if not the same, and arguably in some cases more progressive or more liberal policies coming in, and for, but who themselves was not Black? 
how might that? And so I was thinking a lot about that, about what it would mean to do my job under a Hillary Clinton administration. Now, a lot of that time was was clearly wasted. <laughs> the um, and and what we saw instead was the rise of a nativist movement that elected the most openly racially bigoted nativist president we've had in a century, mm-hmm. and that. And that, and and so it became clear very quickly that to cover such issues in the years to come, we're going to look different than the way I've been covering the issues moving forward. And as I so as I was thinking now about okay, well, what's gonna, what's how's this going to be, and what's this going to look like? And you know, I, I finished my book and publish it. It publishes the second week of November, twenty sixteen, so the week after the election. And as you know, you publish a book and everyone immediately starts asking what the next one is. And you're like, I haven't even finished this one yet. What are you talking about? Right. Right. So I'm at this moment where my day job is changing. I've published this book and everyone's asking me what's coming next. And and I look up and I'm seeing incident after incident of white racial violence towards people who are coded as racial minorities. Mm -hmm. A Muslim woman attacked on a train in Portland by white supremacists, white supremacists showing up the inauguration and, and, and doing the Hail Hitler salutes, uh, the massacres in Charlottesville and in Pittsburgh and in El Paso. Mm-hmm. And it became clear, I mean, truly within weeks, that this was going to be an era of an emboldened and increasingly public white supremacist movement mm-hmm. that where the flames had been so clearly and explicitly fanned by the most powerful politician in our country. And that there was no sign that that behavior was going to abate. And so it felt as if the role of a journalist covering issues of race and justice was going to be not just to document the movement for racial justice, but to document this now backlash to that and this increased era of racialized violence. And so that uh, that was kind of the initial idea. And, and then it became very clear that to do so, I would have to contextualize that with the Obama mm-hmm. years. So much of what right. we were seeing was a response. Mm-hmm. So I need to push my own timeline back further. Right. And then I needed to place these things in a historical context that, that history doesn't begin, you know, the day that you decide the timeline for the book is, right? <laughs> Let me explain to you how racism works starting the day right. Barack Obama was elected. You're not going to ever understand it. You have to go right. back much further because all of this happens in a context. And so yeah. that was kind of how the natural progression of this idea and how it ultimately results in the book that, that I write. Well, what I love too, and it's such a treat to have you at the Mark Twain house, is because just as you said, Mark Twain didn't write about things that his contemporaries weren't writing about. It's just he shifted the lens and wrote about it in a way that opened it up for new people to explore it. And I think that's what your book really does. Which is like a lot of people, they've talked about it. It's like they know that the violence has happened. And to know America is to know the history of violence, to understand it. But this book really puts us in a in a center where we can feel some of these events and start, you connect the dots for a lot of people in this book in a very organized fashion. And I would I would argue as an academic, a qualitative fashion, right? Which is its own very rigorous set of methodologies. But I was thinking about in writing this book, because you're writing it in real time, as you say, did you ever anticipate this backlash to be as swift, as violent, as brutal? You know, we've seen backlashes before in this country where I always use the example of like David Dinkins to Rudy Giuliani, right? New Yorkers, we always knew who Rudy Giuliani was. This is not a surprise. People now are like, oh my gosh, this man's a nut. It's like, no, 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 we already knew. But for a lot of New Yorkers, that that pendulum swing to go from beautiful mosaic to someone who incited a riot on the steps of City Hall, calling mm-hmm. the first black mayor the N word over a bullhorn and letting you know police officers and firefighters possibly storm the Bastille and try and harm the black sitting mayor of New York City, we've seen that. Did you anticipate kind of this? It it felt like a rapid sea change even though we know the context in the history of America and especially the type of racialized violence we've always seen towards people of color, women, others, marginalized groups. I think what's remarkable is that the backlash we saw or the reactionary response that we saw, sometimes people don't like the backlash framing because it suggests, um, and I don't fully agree with them, right? <laughs> but, it, but it suggests that it is a... It, 
that the that the inciting incident is the racialized progress, not the racism to begin with. That if you didn't, if there wasn't a white supremacist status quo, you wouldn't have to have these strides towards equality, right? And I'm truly really aesthetic to that. I understand and I agree with that, right? And also, I, I you know, I think it can get a little semantic, but I think that there was a I think in some ways we were seduced a little bit into a lull in that it, there was enough of a delay. So one thing I've talked about a few times in like book conversations is that if you remember when Barack Obama was elected, and it comes up because that's one of the opening scenes of the book, and you remember talking to Black people, you couldn't have a conversation with Black people for more than 10, 15 minutes where, when, before someone would say, I don't know, man, I think they're going to kill him, though. I pray for that family every night because I don't know if they're going to let him survive. And I, don't, I mean, this was an extremely mainstream held by almost every black person I knew's belief, stance was that there was a deep skepticism that Barack Obama would be allowed to serve as president for four years, mm -hmm. uh, much let less alone eight. Yes, correct. Much less a seven. Term. And when that did not immediately happen, when the actual worst did not Right, it lulled us, I think, a little bit into a complacency about the response that was clearly happening. And so, when we get into these semantic debates about what what level is the Tea Party really a response to, well, well look, you know, and how much of this is about economic and this and that, and and it was clearly and obviously a it was clearly and obviously a reactionary movement powered primarily by white grievance, white racialized grievance. And that was clear at the time, but there was enough plausible deniability and just asking questions, and perhaps there's a nuance here, that we collectively, I, I believe, were lulled a bit into our into a belief that the response wasn't what we what we thought, what we now I think are comfortable declaring that it is. But even as recently as when Donald Trump was elected. There was a robust debate in our public square about whether it was whether it was appropriate for us to describe what he had to describe him as nativist, to describe his movement that way, to how much could be attributed to race versus economic anxiety. It was all this, it was this massive conversation that, with any amount of hindsight, appears extremely ridiculous on its face. Mm -hmm. This is someone whose chief political positions prior to entering presidential politics were railing against the quote unquote ground zero mosque, which was not a mosque and it was not at ground zero, and launching a fraudulent racist campaign to suggest that the first black president was not really an American, and who runs an openly, a deeply openly nativist, racist, xenophobic campaign mm -hmm. in which he vows to construct a a wall and moat around the country to prevent brown people from coming in and to and to end the access to our nation from most of the muslim world mm -hmm. and we are debating whether or not it is okay to describe this person it's it's like well but actually george wallace had some economic policies too right, right? And it's like, well right. sure but that's not like, and i think that and as recently as 2020 when such a president who now has banned much of the Muslim world coming to the country, has attempted to construct the wall, and has engaged in any number of other policies and, att and a direct attacks on Americans of color. We, when he levels clearly and obviously racist attacks on congressmen of color, on the city of Baltimore, right, we see this clutching of pearls among our establishment about whether or not we're allowed to call that what it is. Right. And is there some theoretical missing nuance to the guy who's screaming at the brown people are taking over the country? And I think that that, unfortunately, in our hyper siloed and bifurcated society, what is self-evidentially true and is qualitatively proven to be true is something that still many of our fellow Americans believe is just an opinion or an argument or a take, not the world in which we live. Well, I think that's so important because it took and it is still taking the mainstream media and journalists in general a very long time to call this moment what it is and to call this individual what he is and 
the people who surround him what they are in a lot of ways. And it makes me think about Bell Hooks and her sort of four pillars when she describes this country of, you know, anti-Black racism, white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism. Like those are the four pillars that have hoisted this country up. They're the four pillars that still stand. We can build all the, the window dressing we want, but this is like the foundation of this nation. And I think that there's this reticence to call things white supremacy. I think there's this reticence to explicitly say that certain policies are rooted in anti-Black racism. I mean, the history of every policy in this country has a racist root at the end. I mean, housing, education, transportation, environmental policy, you name it. And so we keep going down this road. And I always think about bell hooks in these four pillars. How much of those did you think about in grounding this book? Because it, and, and I say that largely because, and I, this, this nail color is purely coincidental, and I have not seen the movie yet, but uh, I was having a really robust conversation with my 18-year-old niece about the movie Barbie, which I haven't seen, but they saw it. Um, and the question was, who is this for, right? And this, this idea that this word patriarchy keeps getting thrown out. So that was a buzzword after Donald Trump was elected. We've got the pink hats. Yeah. That's a different panel. <laughs> um, it was like, do your job. We're going to need the pink hats. But we've got patriarchy and capitalism, white supremacy, and anti Black racism. When you think about those four pillars, how do they undergird your larger thesis of the book? Of course. And I, and I think they all, and they all factor together, right? In that, in that anti Blackness and white supremacy are twins in a way they're play you know they're they're not the they're not the twins who look exactly the same they're the ones that are a little different right but they're built <laughs> in the same dna um and and so and what's fascinating and actually and this is also true frankly of patriarchy and misogyny right that when you look at the white supremacist movement and white american white supremacy when you look at um, the history of american <clears throat> conservative conservative reactionary response it is very intertwined with these extremely patriarchal ideas and structures and frameworks that there is an infantilization uh, and and uh, and ownership towards white women that is foundational to the ideology of American white supremacy. The obsession of white supremacists is the defiling of the innocent white woman who has to be protected and saved and 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 so. It, and that is found fundamentally patriarchal in addition to racist, right? right. That, and so those things can't be separated. When you look at the rise of the other powerful white supremacist movements in our history, the Klan, for example, in the 1920s, which is a clear forebearer of the Make America Great Again movement that we see, um, you see a movement that is as spurned on by immigration and cultural change what we then called technological innovation, the invention of birth control, the ability for women to now have more sexual autonomy and, and freedom and safety from their from the traditional family structure, a world that was more urban and more integrated because we're now a generation post, uh, post the Civil War, right? And that and much of what was driving the rise, I mean, when we watch the birth of the nation, it's unquestionably racist, right? But the foundational ideology of this is the belief that these relatively helpless, innocent white women are going to be corrupted and stolen and broken by these savage, brutish black men, right? And that in and of itself is a form of misogyny and patriarchy, patriarchy right? And so there's deep intersection. I think that when we look at capitalism, right, we first, we look at the ways in which capitalism exploits these other systems to perpetuate itself. Mm -hmm. Secondarily, the way that a pursuit of capitalism prevents institutions and individuals from dismantling these other, these other dynamics that they themselves would claim to oppose. Mm -hmm. So why, uh, why might, a mainstream news organization refused to call racism by its proper name. Well, that news organization 
very often is supremely focused on how that decision to tell the truth will be perceived by the people who it sells its newspapers to. Mm -hmm. Well, in a nation in which we are still deeply majority white, tens of millions of more white Americans than anyone else, in which white Americans hold the vast majority of the wealth and spending power in the United States of America, in which, in which these institutions have built themselves to cater to such an audience for generations and since their inceptions, suddenly a, the pursuit of profit, the pursuit of capitalism, the incentivizes not telling the truth about these other pillars. Mm -hmm. And it does not even have to be a knowing mm -hmm. decision made by individuals because they're working inside of a, of a program that the norms themselves of these institutions and of these companies have been structured in such a way from their inception that you believe you are making a journalistically values-based decision, but in fact, the very outline of how such decisions are made was made based on extracting as much capital as possible from theoretical readers and made by people whose politics cared very much less about Mm -hmm. that who many of them did not believe in multiracial democracy to begin with. Now, you know, part of why I love and respect Twain so much is his reading of white women, because the way we've structured, you know, every country is different, but the way we've structured it is that only a white woman can make a white man. He's had several books where, you know, you've got very, very fair skinned black people who are 116th, 132nd, but hey, they're still black because mm -hmm. that's how we defined it. So over time, this is like the collective freak out that we, you know, as you said, there's still millions of more white people, but there we know that 2040 is coming, right? When Latinos have already overtaken black populations and they'll be overtaking white populations. There is this collective fear, but I wanted to kind of uh, tie in some of the things that you just laid out because our, our good friend and colleague, Jason Johnson, you know, has said many times that in some ways, Barack Obama broke the country. Because if we think about America as a female sense, you know, she's now dated a black guy. She's she slept with a black guy for eight years in the White House. And there's something about this white grievance that you've laid out for us that can't ever see this country as pure and whole anymore for a lot of these people. And essentially, they're willing to burn it to the ground because it doesn't mean anything to them anymore. Do you sort of subscribe to that to a certain extent? Or do you see it from a slightly different lens? Well, I do subscribe to it, but I would push the lens back further. I think it's helpful for us. We need to not think of Barack Obama as the beginning of something new, but rather as the continuation of something already happened. Mm -hmm. That Barack Obama, and, and let me be clear, this is not me denying the historic significance of his election, right? But let's be clear, Barack Obama does not actually- Yes, hold on. I love how you said, let's be clear, because that's his tell. Yeah, let me be clear. <laughs> let's be clear. Yeah, yeah. The, um, there, Barack Obama does not actually mark a foundational governmental change. Mm -hmm. The change happens with the in Selma with the foundation of multiracial democracy. That is one of the most important. I remember when John Lewis died talking to C. Jackson, and he said this to me, and Obama, Barack Obama actually used this same line later. That Jesse Jackson said John Lewis was a founding father, that American democracy did not exist pre-Selma and the Pro Voting Rights Act. And at that point, under the letter of the law, we had a democracy. And until that point, we did not, right? That's not to suggest that we have not taken many steps and strides to right. undo that. But at that point, we became, for the first time in our history, not an explicitly white supremacist state and not a racial apartheid state, which we had been post-Civil War, pre-Civil Rights, right? And... And so Barack Obama is the obvious eventual outcome of a multiracial democracy. Mm -hmm. The moment that happened, Barack Obama was destined at some point. Maybe not him specifically, right? Like, but once we- The possibility was born. Yeah, for the first time. And it was literally impossible previously, right? And so the, it, it's so we, I quote in the book, the historian David Chalmers, who writes what's Hooded Americanism, which is the definitive history of the Ku Klux Klan. 
And we can use the Klan as a stand-in. It's important to understand the Klan was not the only white supremacist group committing such acts of vigilante violence. There were others at the time and others since, right? But in so much as we study the Klan's history, we can use them as a stand-in, right? That today's white supremacists can be understood as Klansmen, mm -hmm. whether that's what they are calling themselves or not, right? And that's not to deny ideological distinctions, right? But we can talk about Christians and understand the Presbyterians and the Baptists are a little different, mm -hmm. right? So- And the evangelicals are- they, oh, correct. Well, and really depending on which flavor of evangelical- right. Right. And that's the and there's racialized components to that. <laughs> so the the um, and I say that to say Chalmers writes and he writes his he I think the most recent update to his book, he writes in like the 70s or 80s or early Americanism. And he writes, he goes. Something has changed. He, he, he writes that for the history of the Klan in America, it had always been a dispositionally conservative organization. And what he means by that is the Klan was winning. They were the vigilante defenders of the status quo. Mm -hmm. They were protecting the white supremacist system. Mm -hmm. They weren't trying to overthrow anything. They were trying to keep things exactly as they are. Right. That, that changes post-civil rights. They are no longer winning. They have lost. There is no longer a white supremacist the, uh, status quo. That racial inequality is no longer the law of the land. And at that point, in what at the time the historians would call the third clan, the post-civil rights clan, mm -hmm. although we now don't even talk about it as the clan because we understand it's all these other people calling themselves whatever they want to call themselves. The clan and the white supremacist movement become revolutionary. That they believe they have to overthrow the government to spark a new one to get back to what they have now lost. Right. And once you and when your politics become revolutionary in that sense, your trade-offs of what is acceptable the level of violence you will commit, it's fundamentally different. Now, again, don't let me suggest for a moment that there was not deep bloodshed and unspeakable acts of violence during Reconstruction, during the rise of the Klan, right? But they didn't believe the people they were killing were humans. Right. They were wrong, right? But they didn't believe that. Timothy McVeigh believed every person. There was not some, right. I'm not really committing murder right. ideology. He believed that in order to spark the race war and get back to a white supremacist society, that he had to kill innocent pe people. He believed to be innocent people. Right. That is a totally different tactic than much of the history of the white supremacist movement. And yet that's the tactic we see in Charleston, in Buffalo, in El Paso, in Tree of Life, in Pittsburgh. And this idea of a truly, this is so dire and so urgent and so revolutionary that we're sure shooting up a church during prayer meeting. Right, right. And that's just fundamentally different. It's a shift. Well, and what I think, and you know, I always add in Charlottesville, one person died in Charlottesville. It wasn't a mass shooting by definition, but I think seeing people in khakis and their teachers and graduate students and journalists marching saying we won't be replaced goes to your theory of, Anytime we think about equality, for some, that is loss. Yes. Adding other people with rights and freedoms, they're feeling this is this is a loss for me and I need to fight for it. So I guess for you in doing all this very detailed research, I might add, what does a, a possible, you know, we've always heard this conversation, the Civil War, because you've said these folks, they're in it to win it, right? I mean, they're stockpiling weapons, right? They're making sure they they they're in this kind of, war zone mentality because they feel like they've been taken over, right? First it was the Blacks, now it's immigrants, now it's women in their, you know, their rights. So like all these, these ideas are very frightening and it feels like complete and total loss. What does a civil war look like in the 21st century based on some of the research that you've done? And I think it's interesting, right? And I think that it's, I mean, right now we're seeing vigilante terroristic violence mm -hmm. we're seeing and, and p.s sorry to cut you off wasn't why don't we use the word domestic terrorism much more than we do we use it with timothy mcveigh every mm -hmm. now sporadically but for all these other individuals that we hear about on a daily basis why aren't we using that that term we, we use it we use it with mcveigh along with mcveigh what's interesting is that we there was a years-long concerted effort to deny he was a white supremacist 
he was some lone wolf, anti-tax guy, who knows what's, and it's extreme that there's not, the objective evidence is remarkably clear. Timothy Mavey was a, a full-on racist white supremacist trying to start a race war. There was not any, there's no debate. It's just that we pretended that wasn't true at the time. And for various reasons, I mean, it's interesting, um, this book didn't get much press for reasons that'll become obvious as soon as I say he wrote it, but Jeffrey Tubin just put out a, re a book recently uh, called Homegrown that is all about, to, it's a biography of Timothy McVeigh. Okay. Um, and given the, that I've been writing this book, I've, I've read it. It's a, it's a very well done, very well researched yeah. book. And he looks at the, in some ways, he looks at the political decisions that were made about the prosecution of McVeigh coming out of the failings in Ruby Ridge, coming out of the circus of the OJ trial, the realities of like, and there was a deep concerted effort to try to make McVeigh from a prosecutorial standpoint to make him a sing, this is not some referendum on race across America. This is not a, this is one crazy guy who killed children. Lock him, you know, like, and while that may have made sense in a short term as a tactical decision for a prosecuted, prosecutorial standpoint, it did, uh, Tubin concludes, and I, I would conclude too, it did um, restrict the public's ability to understand what had happened. Mm -hmm. And and so we have a hard time very often, you know, when we think about terrorism, and this and this factors into the ability for this factors into the ability for um, for law enforcement to respond as well. Right. When we think about terrorism, we primarily think about foreign terrorism, which in this context almost always means Muslim terrorism, Islamic terrorism. Right. Right. And in that case, because much of much Islamic terrorism is done in conjunction or in the express support of a, a few sets of groups, groups who are internationally declared as terroristic organizations, right? To do anything in concert with such a group is to violate law from the very beginning to and that triggers the ability for the government federally and locally to monitor you to disrupt you to surveil you to do whatnot right the equivalent in the domestic sense is much more difficult due to our first commandment uh, considerations a group of white guys can drink beers in the woods every weekend and shoot at photos of barack obama and on the one hand one might suggest that if you're trying to deal with potential terrorists these are the kind of guys you got to pay attention to and on the other hand these are U.S. citizens exercising their First and Second Amendment rights. Government has no right to show up and tell them they can't shoot at pictures of Barack Obama, right? And both of those things are true. That is objectively true. These are people exercising their First Amendment rights, right? And so we have a difficulty there. And there's a sensitivity, understandably, or at least a stated sensitivity, because we also know one day we'll get files that show that they're spying on all of us anyway, right? There's this belief that the government, due to the... To the, the bad behavior of the civil rights era under Hoover, we have to be extra careful. We can't monitor anyone. And, and, and look, and those of us with Melvin and our sins, keep them honest on that. And it's important. But what is also true is that creates this ultra sensitivity about the way that we engage American citizens that I would suggest does not cut equitably and equally. That some of these groups can get away with stuff you and I could not get away with. No Absolutely. one would be arguing, well, they're First Amendment rights of us. Or Second we, Amendment rights. We know that. We know that, right? But I'm like, Philando Castile was a registered gun owner. Correct. Right. And who had informed the officer that the gun was there, right? And, and so, so we know that it doesn't quite work that way. Right. But there is this sense of, um, I think we have a real hard time admitting and acknowledging to get back to really the question you asked me and, and, and to another one is that we have a very hard time seeing the world for what it is. And part of that is because of our own individual and collective biases that frankly, we remain a, a majority white country learning in textbooks and living in institutions created for and by those white Americans. And we're wondering why it's more difficult for us to accept and to grapple with the danger presented by a subsection of white Americans due to their racial prejudice. Right. And the reality is the people telling the story and writing the textbooks and, and facilitating the conversation have a vested interest in not believing what is true. Right. 
Well, I mean, I think that's the conversation that we're having. It's like, they're taking away all the knowledge in our books in Florida. It's like, but they already have, right? This is why most people only know about Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, and Frederick Douglass, right? I have this podcast, you know, called The Blackest Questions. It's like, where we actually get at sort of Black history that's not sort of the five Black people that most individuals know. I mean, you know, so much of what we know about Black history is like supplemental learning on our own or from our parents or at home, um, but it's definitely not in, in an academic setting. Okay, so Wes, I wanna make sure that people have time for Q&A. So I'm gonna just do some lightning round questions, okay? So we're just gonna keep them succinct. Do you think it's possible for non-whites to ever become full citizens in this country? Possible, yes. Okay. Um, what are you most fearful of in this moment? And what gives you the most hope in this moment, having submerged yourself in this this data and this research for the past few years? What really, what really scares me and frustrates me is the extent to which we don't know our history and don't have an accurate sense of where we are, and and that the I think the average person, even the average hyper intelligent educated person, knows twenty percent of what they need to know about our history and, and has accepted twenty percent of the realities necessary to understand our country. And that is our starting point. Uh, there are people who it's way worse and way less. The thing that gives me a lot of hope always is that, and I'm not that old, but younger people coming up who we, we've yet to see the full rise of a leadership class of people who were born into a country with a black president. Mm -hmm. Getting there, a few of them are, but that but each generation can dream of things and will succeed and create things that the generation before them could not have even imagined. And we already see that, I think, in a lot of the political conversations we're seeing. And that is always exciting to me. I'm very ready to be retired and let them run all the stuff. Right. I mean, shout out to all the educators who were at this talk. But I was, that's, I think that's why everyone's like, why are you, you know, you write all this crazy stuff, but it's, you're, I'm very pragmatically optimistic. And I'm like, you can't spend time with the youth and not be pragmatically optimistic about this country. Like, they got it. Now, will we ever hand them the baton? septuagenarians and octogenarians in Washington, D.C. and state houses across the country? That's mm -hmm. a different question. But they're, they're there and they're paying attention. They're putting things together. Yes. Well, and, the, and the rules of the game remain rigged against justice, right? We are inherit, we are handing them a game board that they are set up to lose. Yeah. But that does not mean that I don't trust, that I don't have hope for their innovations to figure out a way to, to, to win anyway. Yeah. There isn't it. There's, there's something... Um, there's something, especially about Gen Zs, they remind me, I'm a Gen Xer. I know you're a little bit younger. I got mm -hmm. gray hair. Um, you know, we're like the last of like the feral generation. You know, it's like, we're just like, we're latchkey kids. It's like, we get in where we fit in. But Gen Z, because of the housing crash, because of so much chaos that that came right before them, they're sort of, they're a little, they're a little thick skinned like Gen Xers, which, which makes me very happy. Um, okay, so um, what are you reading right now? Oh, that's a good question. I am reading, right now I'm reading the Black journalist Barbara Reynolds wrote the first biography of Jesse Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm working my way through that right now, in addition to a few other things, but that's the that's the top of my list right now that I'm working on. Um, I hope you, I always have my students read um, Jesse Jackson's interview in Playboy magazine from 1969. I teach that article and I'm like, Playboy is really good for articles. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had any parents call me yet, but it's like, you know, it's like a 26 page article that is just pure brilliance. I mean, mm. pure, pure brilliance. Um, okay, what, uh, what books should our guests on Zoom, what should they pick up this summer as it comes to a close? Well, something oh, that's a really good question. Read, besides, so, obviously, American White Lash. But yeah, yeah. And they, well, you know, they don't need to pick it up. They just need to order it. You can just purchase it. You guys don't have to read it. You just, you know, right. but, um, you know, I, I, I do think that, you know, I'm thinking a lot about memory and how we remember our history. And so I always talk about my good friend Clint Smith's book, How the Word is Passed, mm -hmm. which I just think is a beautiful book. It's really yes. well done. It's really excellent. Um, I myself have been working a bit through, you know, I, I've been trying to think about in this moment, I really like reading things from the past that are, and so I've been working my way back through August Wilson, for example, mm -hmm. you know, and so, and I'm not a huge fiction person, but I, and not a huge play person either, but I've like really been trying to find space. And so with Denzel Washington reproducing all of the August Wilsons, I've been trying to like, make sure I read my way through before I see the, the play or the movie in right. each case. Absolutely. And so and there's been a lot to that too. 
Well, I go to the theater about twice a week. And so I've already decided that since you're at Newmark and you're going to be in New York a little bit more, uh, we're, we're going to go see Appropriate, Brandon Jacobs Jenkins play. And it's about a white family. So it's a black playwright, but a white family that finds a book of pictures of black men who have been lynched after oh their goodness. father passes. And they're trying to figure out why would dad have this album of black people who have been lynched? And the play goes on from there. And it's pure brilliance. I saw it off, off Broadway and it's coming to Broadway uh, in November. So oh, we're seeing that. Yeah, we're yeah, seeing yeah. that. Um, okay. So Mark Twain is my favorite author. I, that's why I, I'm so deeply honored and proud to be a trustee of the museum. Puddinhead Wilson is my absolute favorite book. You know, you mentioned twins before and I almost jumped out of my skin because everything in that book is a foil. You know, he wrote it and it's like, if you're a starch racist, segregationist or if you're an integrationist abolitionist the book makes sense to you who's your favorite author like you know I read a lot of fiction because for me it's hard you know it's hard to write so I need to read fiction to hear language roll around in my head and I'm always afraid of plagiarizing so <laughs> I, I'll read you know just novel after novel because it's just like that's how that's my process but who's who are some of your favorite authors that you know you think about them and like literally your your cheeks just go like this Oh, that's so, that's so interesting. I think that, so one, I mean, it's it's hard to escape the Twains and Hemingways and the, you know, like it, the, the classics of the classics for reasons. I've mm -hmm. honestly, I'm going back to Gerald, Gerald next to me right now um, for, um, you know, there <clears throat> there's, you know, people don't think of Fitzgerald is having written much about race, but I, I would actually suggest if you reread his books, there's a lot of race in them. Uh -huh. Um and you know and there's high time beginning. There there are and there are some arguments that have been made. I mean I'm not saying anything public, but that that hasn't been said in public. But there's a I, I think a very strong argument that we all misread Gatsby and is in mm -hmm. fact a passing book. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm I'm working on some stuff related to that. Um, it's a remarkable argument there. Mm -hmm. Um, and so and so that's kind of so I've been in that a bit. Um, you know, for me, I really like. Beyond that, though, and I think part of it's because so much of my space, so much of the space I sit in is nonfiction and narrative nonfiction mm -hmm. that I think about. I don't I don't have a ton of favorite narrative nonfiction longer form writers or like book writers, although John Krakow would be on that list and David Grant, who just had a book come out, would be on that list. But I also I read a lot of newspaper feature writers mm -hmm. and the idea of trying to be accessible yet deliberate and get literary. What does it mean to tell a story over 4,000 words? Because mm -hmm. if you can do it over 4,000 words, then you can do it over 40,000 or you can, or you can tell multiple. And so, um, you know, this goes with what people should read as well, but um, Anne Hall, um, who is a, honestly one of the best newspaper reporters and writers ever, um, and she put out a memoir earlier this year. I want to say it's called Through the Groves. It's about growing up. Her father worked in the orange groves in central Florida. Mm. And she wrote about growing up. Uh, she was a young, she is a lesbian. She was a young queer woman figuring that out. Right. <laughs> young tomboy who yeah. would go out into the orange groves with her father as he descended into some alcoholism and mental health issues as the family broke up. But she is just at a sentence by sentence level, a beautiful in terms of thinking about in nonfiction, you want to you want to earn the beauty of every sentence. Every sentence is reported. It's all factual. I, I can't it's not rainbows and butterflies and bells and whistles, right? It shouldn't be. You can write that way. But there's something that I like and I fetishize as a newspaper guy, right? That like, no, 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 I've earned every that the writing is actually detail. Mm -hmm. Each of these things is a fact that I've spun together to paint a picture for right. you. And and I think Anne does that as, be, as well as any writer ever. Everything has its place. Yeah, I mean, I've gotten way more into short stories too. I just read Sadiq Fofana's Stories from the Tenants Downstairs. You know, it's about Harlem and building in Harlem and each chapter is different uh, folks. And I just, I think short story writers also are just so brilliant because they get in and get out. Right. You pull me in, you make me feel something very deeply and then we're released. I also I also think that the um, you know, I it's interesting, you know, Baldwin is such an obvious answer, but it's interesting because I actually don't love Baldwin's nonfiction, but I think he's like the best fiction writer ever. 
I, 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 I actually think it's criminal that more people haven't read Giovanni's Room, for example, or had not read Beale Street prior to prior to Barry Jenkins's adaptation. Right? Like the, the, their argument, I mean, some of the most beautiful thoughts turn into sentences that have been written in the English language come from Baldwin's pen and his fiction. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry for our listeners in the chat. Um, Omar, let me know if we have any questions for Q&A. Obviously, I could talk to Wesley. Oh, I see right here. Um, I could talk to Wesley about books. So clearly, Wesley, uh, we already have uh, a theater date so we can continue this conversation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll be talking about books forever. We'll be talking about books forever. <laughs> we should just record it and put it on the Mark Twain website. <laughs> um, so Geraldine asks, what actually causes racism or has caused this violent racism? So is it based in the past? What do we do after all this time to make it stop? And there are a few different ways to answer that question. I think one of the first things I would say is, so he gets a lot of attention now um, for his later books, but I actually, I think more people read Ibram Kendi's Stamp from the Beginning, which is, he, the subtitle is A Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America. Mm -hmm. And what he lays out as part of his thesis is that we often misunderstand how interpersonal prejudice works and how it manifests manifest, that we believe that everyone just began, that humanity began with me believing that those other people must have been subhuman or different, right? And what is true is there may have been some competition or fear, but that it was not true that I actually believed I was human and you were not, right? That typically racist, we believe that racist policies and racist status quo come as the response or as the result of interpersonal racial prejudice when almost always the opposite is true. We are born into an unjust world and we have to justify that lack of justice. Mm -hmm. So I live here in a city where there's a set of people who don't have jobs, aren't as educated, commit more crime. Right? What's easier for me to believe that the entire system in which I live is unjust and has been weighted against these people for all of, you, for, for all of contemporary history? or that there's something wrong with those people. And the reality is is a much easier choice for us to make over and over and over again, that there's something wrong with those people. And then once we make that choice to explain the inequity, that then justifies our decision to say, and because there is something wrong with those people, I don't need to open a store over there. I don't need to hire anyone like that. I can pull my kids out of this school and put them in a different one because we don't believe we're creating the inequity. We believe there is something foundationally wrong with those people. Yeah. When we look at this moment, because I think it's also important to think about, and I think we have to complicate this thinking a little bit, right? Racial prejudice and any type of prejudice is human and natural because prejudice is human and natural. We walk down the street, you guys logged in this Zoom today and half of you thought, oh, he's kind of, he seems cute and intelligent. Maybe I'll listen to him. And some of them are like, oh, that's what this guy looks and sounds like. Never mind, he's probably an idiot, right? That's a prejudice, right? We make decisions and it's as living beings, we do this to survive our lives. <laughs> Does that alleyway look safe or not? Does that person look friendly or not? Does right in that it's stereotyping. We because we've had one experience, therefore we assume another one, right? Uh, getting back to Walter Lippmann. But what ends up happening? But but the issue becomes when we have politicians, political movements, societal figures who are willing to play on those prejudices to get people to move and to act in these ways. Mm -hmm. Look, it is understandable that if the country is changing rapidly demographically, that, that would cause some anxiety for some people, mm -hmm. right? Because change is anxiety. Change is mm -hmm. what, is, what is so dangerous in our moment is that we have people in the most high and powerful positions in our society cynically exploiting those anxieties with lies mm -hmm. to for their material, financial, and political benefit. Right. And, and that creates a violence. Because here's the thing. If you tell people that we have no border anymore and there are caravans coming over carrying rapists and murderers every night, they're taking over our country, they're coming for your women. If I believe that to be literally true, it is my obligation to take up arms and go to the border and defend it. Right. If the things that were said were actually true, which they are not, right. we would have a moral obligation as members of our society to go stop this thing from happening. So how many times can the president say something like that 
without some amount of people truly believing it. And for a black person, a Jewish person, a Muslim person, a woman, a, a, a queer, transgender person, a debate about whether or not it's one percent of the people or five percent of the people is irrelevant because it takes exactly one such person to walk into the mosque or the synagogue to drive down to the border to bump into me at the restaurant for my life to be ruined and taken and stolen and so i think that's we have to think about the responsibility that are that we have as members of the public square that we know certain types of speech certain types of demonization and dehumanization lead to violence well so we unfortunately we have to wrap up. These talks go by like that. Bye bye. Bye bye, because you're brilliant and you're fun. Um, yeah. But I do want to leave you and our audience members with um, a little anecdote about what you said about stereotypes, because they're very real, right? And we can't pretend that they're not. But one of my besties in college was a white girl who I was saying we traveled all over Europe together. And I said, My grandfather told me, never trust a man with no facial hair. We're having, you know, late night drinks. You know, we're 21, we're drinking. And she says, that's so crazy. My grandfather told me, never trust a man with facial hair. So she's white, I'm black. And my grandfather essentially saying people without facial hair are probably like cops, military, you know, FBI, whatever. So a beard means you can be trusted, which is Wesley, right? And her, her grandfather essentially was like, bearded people are like immigrants. You know, like maybe the laborers there, they're like, it's just, it's a different state of characters. So I think it's like these stereos, and you know, obviously we both reject that, but they come from some place, right? And we're both talking about these two. We, the, the conversation started because we both missed our grandfathers and we loved them so much. And they were both more working class than our upbringing. But how these things get passed down in just general conversation as well, it was never don't like these people, but it's just, a passing comment that somehow sticks to you. So I just, I want to leave our, our listeners or our, our, our participants tonight. Just, I want to thank you all so much for joining us. I want to thank you, Wesley, for writing this amazing book. And so the link is in the chat. Omar put it in the chat. Um, you can buy the book. And I mean, as much as we complain about journalism and one-sided journalism, part of keeping journalism alive is also buying books to make sure journalists can still do their craft. So I want to uh, thank you again, Wesley, for joining us at the Mark Twain House. It's truly my honor to have you here. And I'm looking forward to our theater outing. Well, it's going to be so much fun. I'm looking forward to it too. This is going to be great. <laughs> thank Thanks you, Omar. Thanks again. Thanks again, Wesley, um, for being here with us. And thank you so much, Christina, for acting as moderator again. You're, you're always such a great moderator. Absolutely. My pleasure. <laughs> Thanks to our audience. Please join us for another author program in the future um, and join us at the museum um, when you're in the area. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Bye-bye.